Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Tony Doan, the State Building Code Council Chair. I will be the State Building Code Council's designated hearing officer today and will be conducting this hearing. I now call to order this hearing regarding WAC 5150, Adoption and Amendment of the 2021 International Building Code Structural Provisions and the 2021 International Existing Building Code, WAC 5151, Adoption and Amendment of the 2021 International Residential Code, WAC 5152, Adoption and Amendment of the 2021 International Mechanical Code, and the 2021 International Fuel Gas Code, WAC 5155, Adoption and Amendment of the 2021 Washington State Wildland Urban Interface Code, WAC 5156, Adoption and Amendment of the 2021 Uniform Plumbing Code. I would like to advise everyone that this hearing is being recorded and the audio file will become part of the official rulemaking file. For the record, this hearing is being held on September 30th, 2022, beginning at 10.06 a.m. at 129 North 2nd Street, Yakima, Washington, 98901 with Zoom and teleconference options. The purpose of this hearing is to receive public comments on a revision to WAC 5150, International Building Code, Structural Provisions, and International Existing Building Code, WAC 5151, International Residential Code, WAC 5152, International Mechanical Code and International Fuel Gas Code. WAC 5155, the new Washington State WUI Code and WAC 5156, Uniform Plumbing Code. This hearing is being conducted in accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act, RCW 42.30, and the Administrative Procedures Act, RCW 34.05. Legal notice of this hearing was filed with the Washington State Code Revisor on August 23rd, 2022. The Washington State Register number for WAC 5150 is WSR2217151. The Washington State Register number for WAC 5151 is WSR2217148. The Washington State Register number for WAC 5152 is WSR2217147. The Washington State Register number for WAC 5155 is WSR2217150. The Washington State Register number for WAC 5156 is WSR2217153. Notice of this hearing was also posted on the SBCC website at sbcc.wa.gov. This hearing is being held to consider testimony on the proposed CR102. At this time, I will briefly exp explain the proposed changes. For the 2021 IBC structural, the council received seven proposals. The IBC Technical Advisory Group recommended approval of five proposals as submitted or as modified. Three proposals have already been approved with the group one codes. The council Recommends, recommended filing the proposed rule to allow input through the public hearing process. For the 2021 IEBC, the council received 11 proposals. The IBC Technical Advisory Group recommended approval of 10 proposals as submitted or as modified. One proposal was withdrawn by the proponent. The council recommended filing the proposed rule to allow input through the public hearing process. For the 2021 IRC, the council received 13 proposals. The IRC and IMC technical advisory groups recommended approval of 10 proposals as submitted or as modified. The council recommended filing the proposed rule with one additional proposal added to the recommended packet to allow input through the public hearing process. For the 2021 UPC, the council received six proposals. The UPC technical advisory group recommended approval of three proposals as submitted or as modified. The council recommended filing the proposed rule with four proposals to allow input through the public hearing process. For the 2021 IMC IFGC, the council received 15 proposals. The IMC technical advisory group recommended approval of 13 proposals as submitted or as modified. The council recommended filing the proposed rule to allow input through the public hearing process. For the 2021 WUI code, the council received three proposals. 
The WUI Technical Advisory Group recommended approval of one proposal as submitted or as modified. The council recommended filing the proposed rule with three proposals to allow input through the public hearing process. Okay, before we get into the testimony, I'd like to cover a few things. Uh, first, I'm gonna go over some things to keep in mind for public testimony. All testimony should be brief, concise, and honest. Speakers should address their comments to matters pertinent to the code proposals or subject matter at hand. Avoid reading lengthy written testimony. Instead, orally highlight important points in the written report. If others are offering similar testimony, try to coordinate information to avoid repetition. Simply stating agreement with the points raised by prior speakers will help move the hearing along so that all who wish to speak will have the opportunity to do so within a reasonable time. Large groups whose members wish to speak are encouraged to designate a spokesperson. There will be no question and comments by council members. If you must give a personal opinion, make sure that the council understands that you are not speaking for an organization, but for yourself. If proposing a modification of the material being discussed, please be prepared to follow up with comments in writing. The following are items that will not be allowed. No disruption of the orderly conduct of the public hearing will be tolerated. The speakers and audience shall refrain from abusive or profane remarks, disruptive outbursts, applause, protests, engaging in disruptive conversation, speaking out of turn, preventing or attempting to prevent others who have the floor from speaking or other conduct which disrupts or interferes with the orderly conduct of the hearing. Personal attacks on the council members, staff, or members of the public are out of order. It is not appropriate in the public hearing for a speaker to debate a matter under consideration with other speakers, the audience, or members of the council. Engaging in such conduct and failing to cease upon request will be grounds for ending a speaker's time at the podium or for removal of any disruptive person from the meeting room. Before we get into the testimony, I'd like to make a couple of announcements. There will be council members that are on Zoom uh, that are currently on. And so as you're going through public testimony, you are not just addressing uh, myself and SBC staff, but there was, are also other council members uh, that are attending on Zoom. As mentioned in the things to keep in mind, this is not an opportunity to discuss items uh, on the agenda or with the code proposals with council members and council members are not to make comment or questions during this process. If you're doing a testimony through Zoom, please turn on your camera so people can see your face. And we will have a hard stop today at two o'clock. So we will be available for public testimony from now until 2 p.m. We will now hear oral testimony regarding the proposed changes. For the record, please identify yourself and whom you represent, if any. Please speak clearly so we can get a good recording of your testimony. In order to ensure that everyone has a chance to make comments in a timely manner, please limit your comments to three minutes. We will now start public testimony. We are going to start with WAC 5150, IBC Structural. Here's my list. And at this time, we do not have anyone signed up for IABC Structural. We will now go to WAC 5150, IEBC. And we have Chris Edmark. Are you able to unmute her? I'm not able to. When we call on you, if you're on Zoom, if you'll just raise your hand so you come to the top of the list. And Chris? Oh, there it is. Unmute okay. me. Excellent. I had to unmute me. Okay. Okay. Your time um, starts now. Thank you. Okay. My comment is on the uh, change to substantial damage and substantial. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I have to get my thing back, screen back. Um, 
using the building valuation table Chris, is something okay chris i apologize are you able to turn your camera on oh i don't know let me try and find out if i can okay. do that dun, 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 dun. i've paused your time just for the record swap video and their screen full screen i'm looking um uh speakers i'm not okay unless you can help me i nope I, that's okay go ahead and continue okay so let me right. change my view again and i've got to get back to my okay other uh documentation here uh, the building valuation data is very general and it doesn't take into, you know, regional cost. I think that I would like to propose that they add a clause in there or otherwise determined by the building official because in the local assessors can provide very good data on the current market value. They are consistently uh, evaluating the properties for the purposes of uh, taxes. Um, I'd like to follow up in writing on this. I think that it's going to be more work for the, the building department because we are going to have to try and buy our revenue, determine what our modifiers are, where if we just go to the assessor's data or make it an option to use the assessor's data or other data as determined by the building official. And I'll leave my remarks to that and follow up when writing. Okay, thank you. We have no one else signed up for the public testimony on the IEBC. We will go to WAC 5151, the IRC, International Residential Code. And for that, we have Mike Moore. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. We have Andrea Smith first. My apologies. Thank you. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Your time starts now. Awesome. All righty. Good morning, everyone. Um, for the record, my name is Andrea Smith. I'm here on behalf of the Building Industry Association of Washington. Um, as I stated yesterday, we have 8,000 members across the state that represent all aspects of residential construction. And we're here today to speak in opposition to the inclusion of the EV supply charging infrastructure proposal that was included in the IRC CR 102. Um, first and foremost, we believe that the SBCC lacks the authority to pass this in, within the IRC. There's no legislative mandate to adopt EV charging requirements within the residential code. And the, the House bill that passed 1287 um, as written, only includes R3 occupancies, a term used specifically by the IBC. This term doesn't exist in the IRC, rather um, they use the term dwellings. Um, therefore, legislative intent is not sufficient for the adoption of a rule outside of the scope that was authorized in 1287. A code of this nature really belongs in the electrical code, which is handled by LNI. If you recall at the June 17th SBCC meeting earlier this year, the LNI representative on the SBCC stated, Sizing of circuits is dedicated and determined by equipment being used, providing specific specifications for a branch circuit without knowing the equipment being installed would be meaningless. And our members agree. We conducted a member survey and found that 40%, 47% of new homes that are currently being constructed being constructed are being built with EV charging capabilities in one way or another. Um, this is simply because consumer demand is driving these installations. And the only exceptions are where um, they're building less expensive homes where adding this feature simply does not pencil out. And also in instances where the electrical infrastructure cannot support the increased load and must be upgraded. And our members provided us with cost estimates upwards of $11,000 per home in a subdivision. We also heard from many building officials about concerns of enforcing this code and should it be adopted. The primary concerns were One basically minute. the lack of qualified staff to ensure compliance. We urge you to listen to the people charged with building and enforcing this code and would like to see that this um, proposal is not um, submitted into permanent rulemaking. Thank you. Thank you. We will now go to Mike Moore. Mike, if you could raise your hand on Zoom.
Mike, when you begin to speak, your time will start. Thank you. Am I coming through? You are. Great. My name is Mike Moore. I'm representing Brown Newtone today and speaking in support of proposal 21 GP2062 to the IRC. Um, I have the same testimony for proposal 21 GP2063 for the IMC. So I'll just say it once here and, um, and just note that, <clears throat> that it applies to both codes because it's the same, essentially the same text. Uh, this text proposes new kitchen range hood minimum performance requirements that will bolster the IAQ and dwelling units in Washington. And the proposed improvements in the minimum performance targets for the range hoods are really aligned with the latest work out of Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in California regarding acceptable exposure to hazardous pollutants. And these proposed requirements have been thoroughly vetted with industry. Uh, the version of the proposals that were presented um, to the Washington SBCC or simplified versions of California's latest requirements uh, that are designed to improve compliance and enforcements and send clear signals to industry regarding the single target that would um, provide the minimum performance that would be acceptable for controlling pollutants of concern. Um, compliant products are widely available to address these new performance targets that are uh, being proposed and the incremental equipment costs associated with them can be as low as zero dollars when using electric cooking equipment. Uh, and that's the direction that the construction industry is headed. So it dovetails nicely with, um, with future construction um, practices that are expected in Washington state. And looking forward, the proposal sets the stage for transitioning um, from a minimum range hood airflow, which is the traditional target that's been used to using a minimum capture efficiency metric, which is based on actual performance. And as we focus on performance, as with all aspects of the code, we can ultimately steer the market towards um, better performance at lower costs and at less energy consumption while offering better protection for homeowners. I've served as the chair of ASHRAE 622, and it's my personal opinion that the language is a great model for national codes and standards to follow, and I urge the council's approval. Thanks for the opportunity to address the council today. Thank you. Kathleen Petrie. Okay, we'll catch up with Kathleen later. We will move to what's that? Yeah, that's not the order we have here, though. Yeah, we'll go to the WAC fifty one fifty two. Uh, International Mechanical Code and the Fuel Gas Code. And first on the list is Andrea Smith. Hello again. Hi. Your time starts now. Great. Um, for the record, my name is Andrea Smith on behalf of the Building Industry Association of Washington. Um, we're here today also in opposition to the range hood ventilation proposals that are currently on the table. Um, specifically, we'd like to see a uniform standard applied for all ranges, not singling out any ranges based on specific fuel types. Um, you'll hear from proponents of the proposals that cooking with natural gas is bad for your health. Um, that is simply not true. Proponents reference studies that support their arguments, understandably so, but fail to mention that many of these studies are conducted in a controlled environment, typically in um, such environments like laboratories or a specific floor plan of a home where many variables can be changed. Um, further, it's what you're cooking that emits harmful substances that decrease air quality and cause different health concerns. And what others forget to mention is that the self-cleaning function of every oven is the primary culprit of the emission of harmful byproducts like carbon monoxide that causes health issues. As with any other sort of code, especially this code and the energy code, um, these code proposals rely on human behavior to really um, drive home the goals of the code. Um, now I'll admit that not long ago, I found out that um, cooking with ventilation is very important. Um, that's something that they don't necessarily teach you in school. And um, if your parents don't teach you, then you just don't know. And um, I definitely think that um, 
others are also unaware of this danger. Um, we can't sit, we cannot simply fix all of society's problems with regulation. Um, this definitely needs to be on the topic of discussion for our legislature to come up with some way of um, creating consumer awareness of the importance of ventilating. Um, this is not a function of the SBC, of course. And so we ask you to not include these proposals in permanent rulemaking. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Jonathan Kotcher. <clears throat> Jonathan, your time starts now. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Great. Um, my name is Johnny Kocher, and I work at RMI, a climate not policy nonprofit working to accelerate the clean energy transition. I thank the State Building Codes Council staff and members for the opportunity to speak today. We encourage the State Building Codes Council to pass all proposals today, especially the science-based IRC IMC range hood proposals requiring differentiated ventilation requirements for gas stoves. The evidence is now very clear. For, the, for a long time, nitrogen dioxide was used for a proxy for measuring exposure to air pollution, but that has changed. There's a new study showing that exposure to nitrogen dioxide, even in short doses and at low levels, can lead to a variety of health effects. The latest to 2016 EPA Integrated Science Assessment, or ISA, which analyzed all the latest literature for the first time, found a casual relationship between short-term exposures to nitrogen dioxide and respiratory effects and likely causal exposure for long-term exposure and respiratory effects, including the development of asthma. In this over 1,000 page document, something, something else became very clear. Indoor exposure is critical. Two key points from the ISA. The evidence show that the indoor exposure to nitrogen dioxide may be associated with more health effects than outdoor exposure, and that repeated short-term exposures lead to long-term exposures and increasing incidence of asthma. And in the same study, the EPA states that the homes with gas stoves have a 50 to 400% higher concentrations of nitrogen dioxide than homes with electric stoves. So it is very clear that cooking on a gas stove at home is very likely a source of repeated short-term exposure. Gas stoves also generate more particulate matter than electric stoves during the act of cooking. Research from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab indicates that increased range hood ventilation rates from gas stoves, such as the required amount of 250, 250 CFM stated in the proposal, decreased both NOx and PM2.5 pollution One in homes below rates that are dangerous for health occupants. Similarly, the 160 CFM rate for electric stoves was shown to reduce 2. PM 2.5 rates below rates that are dangerous for the health of occupants. I highly encourage the State Building Codes Council to pass these science-based proposals, which will improve the health of Washingtonians. Thank you. Thank you. Claire Richards. Hi. Um, Claire, your you. time starts now. Thank you. Thank you for having us here, here to accept comment. My name is Claire Richards and I'm a nurse scientist and here on behalf of the Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. Um, I'm here to support strengthening the building code to have high ventilation rates on stoves. This will improve the health of Washingtonians and reduce health disparities in Washington state. Essentially the pollutants related to burning gas affects our lungs, hearts, brains, kidneys, causes stillbirth, preterm birth and pre premature death and especially asthma. This is also a concern because of our, of our primary public health strategies for reducing exposure to hazardous wildfire smoke is to ask people to stay inside and close their windows and doors, but without sufficient ventilation on gas stoves, this would increase exposure to indoor sources of air pollution. Given predictions of increased wildfire due to climate change, we should invest now in creating healthier infrastructure. Also, decreasing exposure to pollutants in the home, such as by increasing ventilation requirements, has the potential to decrease tremendous healthcare costs over the coming decades. Asthma poses a tremendous economic burden in the United States broadly, costing at least $80 billion a year. Moreover, Washington state has one of the highest rates of asthma in the nation. This is also a concern of equity. Communities of color and low income communities have a higher asthma have higher asthma rates due to greater exposure to indoor and outdoor air pollution sources. 
Research has shown that people of color have higher than average exposure to particle pollution across many different sources, including gas stoves. Low income communities have smaller homes that expose them to more air pollution and they often have unventilated or poorly ventilated stoves. The way to reduce health disparities is to control pollution at the source. This means that strengthening the ventilation requirements in buildings is a very important way to reduce health disparities and allow children to reach their full potential, regardless of what zip code they grow up in. Thank you. Thank you. Just a reminder to those on Zoom, if you're able, please uh, turn your camera on. Next, we have Andrea Velarde. Hello. Um, actually, we don't get an option to turn our cameras on. Members of the State Building Cold Council, thank you for providing this opportunity for testimony. My name is Andrea Lynn Velarde Bentran, and I'm a resident in Yakima, Washington, representing WPSR at PNWU, Pacific Northwest University. I'm a medical student at PNWU training to become a doctor with a goal of serving underserved communities. I strongly urge you to adopt this proposed update to increase ventilation requirements. Increasing ventilation requirements allows for toxic fumes produced by gas powered um, appliances to be more effectively removed from homes, which will protect our community's health. Updating this code is important for addressing the health equality equity of our underserved communities who might live in a smaller space and already be affected by higher levels of pol pollution in their communities. As a future physician, these health concerns will be at the root of my diagnosis and there's no better treatment than prevention of irreversible long-term damage. This proposal can save thousands of healthcare dollars while maintaining health equity in our communities. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Rebecca Hosha. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, your time will start now, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Members of the State Building Code Council, thank you so much for providing this opportunity for testimony. My name is Rebecca Hosha and I am a resident of Yakima, Washington. I am also a student doctor at Pacific Northwest University's College of Osteopathic Medicine and I'm training to provide optimal patient care to rural, underserved and vulnerable individuals. As a future osteopathic physician, my goal is to treat the whole person. This means treating not only the physical aspect of a person's health, but mental, emotional, and spiritual, which are all interconnected. When the environment in which an individual resides proves harmful to their physical health, it has a spiraling effect that negatively impacts all facets of that person's health. This places a significant burden on families and communities as individuals affected by home pollution often develop challenging chronic health issues and these individuals struggle to get the appropriate care necessary to heal and recover. Establishing a strong ventilation energy code means setting a high standard for clean energy in the home and in effect setting a high standard for the health and equity of the community, which is able to augment the ability of individuals to live a life where they can be more present in family unit, units and actively uh, engage in their community circles, free from the burden of pollution related health problems. Today, I strongly encourage you to adopt these updated ventilation proposals. Thank you so much again for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Next, we have Larry Andrews. Larry, your time will start now. Yeah. My name's Edwin L. Andrews II. I go by Larry. I own Andrews Mechanical with my wife. Uh, we're a plumbing, heating, and uh, mechanical contractor. Um, I'm speaking about uh, the code about only MERV 13 air filters. I am speaking against this code. Um, I believe that uh, F300 electronic air cleaners do just as good a job as a MERV 13. And I believe that this amendment would uh, violate RCW 19.27.020 number three, to permit the use of modern technical methods and devices for improvement. Uh, Honeywell air cleaner doesn't put anything into the airstream when properly installed. What electronic air cleaner does is gives you a non-throwable option uh, for real good air cleaning. You wash them um, monthly with is best. Uh, the these don't put any harmful effects into the air. 
uh, the information um, published by Honeywell proves this. We've had these for 50 years and now we're trying to ban them. Um, this is wrong. These air cleaners do just a great job cleaning smoke. And in fact, they're used in smoke eating jobs. Uh, if you have a casino or something, that's what they use for cleaning the smoke out of the casinos. They, they use very little pressure drop in the blower system where a MERV 13 filter has great pressure drop. The more it loads, the more it costs. And then as we're moving more and more into heat pumps and compressors, when a filter gets plugged, the airflow drops and takes the compressor out. One minute. The, the way electronic air cleaner works, it actually cleans the air. It pulls the particle out of the airstream, attaches it to the plates. Thus, there's very little pressure drop and a lot less chance for compressor failure. I encourage you to, uh, to at least add electronic air cleaners to this proposal or remove the proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Randall Cooper. Hey, hello, can you hear me? I can, your time will start now, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. This is Randy Cooper. I'm with the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers and I thank the State Building Code for hearing my testimony today. The, the first point I would like to make is that AHAM is an approved alternate for HVI in California and should be noted as such in all of the relevant clauses in the update to the Washington Building Code. For example, clause 403.4.7.3.1.2 lists HVI and their directory or equivalent, but it does not list AHAM specifically, even though we are listed in the, the previous clause. So we are asking that AHAM also be added to the subsequent clauses where only HVI is listed. Um, AHAM can provide any required documentation for equivalency so we can be added to the subclauses of 403.4.7.3.1.2. AHAM does have a verification and certification program for residential range hoods. It has been accepted by the California Energy Commission for their Title 24 building codes. We meet all of their requirements as a certification body. We are also accepted by EPA as a verification body for Energy Star range hoods and not including AHAM specifically would remove specific products from the market in Washington as we have products listed only in our directory. AHAM is also deeply involved in all the technical matters on range hoods from a new nominal installed airflow rating point, which will be coming through ASHRAE 62.2 in the future to capture efficiency. And I would like to highlight on capture efficiency, which has been added um, to this requirement. So we, we do thank the commission for listening to our previous input about simplifying the requirements to just one, one capture efficiency or equivalent airflow for electric and one for gas. But we do wanna highlight the capture efficiency is not quite ready for regulations. ASTM E3087 does exist, but there's active work across four different labs to improve repeatability and reproducibility. For example, one lab saw a 10% change in capture efficiency from a test on the same range hood in the same lab from morning to afternoon. Thus, there are new requirements that are needed in ASTM E3087 before a certification body can certify to those. Keeping the parallel requirements as you have specified in E4, table 403.4.7.3 is good. It's just that the, the correlation between capture efficiency and airflow may not be accurate. I thank you for your time and would appreciate consideration for adding AHAM as an alternative. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Andy Hochlutner. No? Okay. Anna Janicek? She's 
She's she's not in here. Okay. Okay. Scott Peterson. Scott, go ahead. Uh, hi, this is Scott Peterson with the uh, Northwest Gas Association uh, from Richland, Washington, discussing the uh, gas stove ventilation proposals. Um, I we oppose um, the the bias against natural gas stoves, and uh, when looking at cooking, there are potentially health risks from cooking without ventilation using anything, uh, gas stove, electric stove, uh, fire, whatever. Uh, but, there, um, but there's no science, contrary to what's been said, there is no science uh, indicating that gas stoves are particularly dangerous. So we encourage um, strong ventila ventilation requirements uh, for cooking to protect, for all sources, to protect everyone. So let me say this on the science. Uh, so far, uh, looking at the Physicians for Social Responsibility website and RMI's website, I can't find a single longitudinal uh, peer-reviewed study showing a causal link between natural gas and cooking or space heating or <clears throat> uh, water heating, a causal link between uh, natural gas and um, asthma or any of the conditions that keep getting listed off, uh, such as premature death. Uh, there are, and the reason is there are no longitudinal studies showing that connection. There are zero. And, and so the science is not as simple as uh, what's being presented here. There are meta-analysis and reviews of reviews but inside of all of these scientific, uh, these reviews of scientific studies, uh, there isn't a study that longitudinally shows one minute the connection. Uh, but I, but I can point you to one. Uh, in the study "Cooking Fuels and Prevalence of Asthma: A Global Analysis of Phase Three of the International Study of Asthma and Allergies in Childhood," uh, commonly known as known as Isaac. A uh, quote, which analyzed 512,707 primary and secondary school children from 108 centers in 47 countries, uh, there is no evidence, quote, there is no evidence of an association between the use of gas as a cooking fuel and either asthma symptoms or asthma diagnosis. Uh, and that is, that was done over three years. Uh, and I've seen no rebuttal of this study by anyone who has testified. Uh, and so I think it's time for people to put up or shut up on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Moore. I'm unmuted now, I think. What's that? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, one sec, sorry. See what? I can't hear you. Is there... Are we good? Okay. Mike, I apologize. Your time starts now. Go ahead. Thank you, Mike Moore. Um, Stater LLC representing Brown Newtone. So this, there was a lot of discussion in California's Title 24 recent rulemaking that pointed at the health studies associated with um, exposure to cooking pollutants, not only uh, natural gas uh, products of combustion, but also particulate matter that's generated in electric cooking events as well. And um, so I would just urge the council to go and um, and scour the Title 24 rulemaking for all the documents submitted there, especially through the case reports. That's a great resource um, to answer the, the put up challenge given by the last speaker. Um, I also wanted to state that uh, HVI looked at the 160 CFM target on the electric side of the house and um, 
100% of the listed range hoods in the HVI directory could achieve that 160 CFM target, 93% over the, of the over the range microwaves could hit that 160 CFM target. So it's widely attainable um, if you're installing the, the cheaper form generally of cooking out there. So from a builder's perspective and from a portability perspective, there's really not much to lose if you're looking for the most cost-effective means out there of, uh, of providing cooking and reducing exposure to pollutants. Um, on the gas side of the house, it does get more expensive to hit the targets that are established, but that's based on the concentration of NO2 that's likely to be generated. Again, um, that study was, was done by Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. So, um, you know, the, the targets that are set out there are just to address the pollutants that are generated based on a study of, uh, of typical generation rates, and then um, health studies that look at the health effects of different being exposed to different concentrations of pollutants, especially NO2. So, um, you know, this is all traceable, okay. and I would just encourage the, the council to take the lead in this and move forward with these proposals. Thank you. Thank you. Ian, Casey. Hello, can you hear me? I can, your time starts now, thank you. Yeah, hello, my name's Ian Casey with Northwest Natural, and I'm here to provide comment on the range hood proposal that would increase the exhaust flow rate required at electric and combustion ranges. Uh, I was present during the TAG meeting when this pros proposal was reviewed in the group and ultimately disapproved. And despite that disapproval, the MDE committee chose to move it forward anyway. Um, I think we can all agree that range hoods are a beneficial appliance in our homes. They provide a variety of functions that improve the air quality in our homes, things like evacuating cooking odors, cooking fumes, and providing humidity control. They have served and will continue to serve an important purpose in our homes. Um, there are several proposed changes in section 403 that we can support things like venting range hoods directly to the outdoors. But uh, when it comes to providing new exhaust rates for gas and electric ranges, we have some concerns. The recommended exhaust rates in this proposal are speculative based on limited lab measurements and modeling. We'd like to point out that there is ongoing work being done at the national level by multiple organizations like ASHRAE, who has a work group actively developing a range hood metrics to be incorporated in their updated 62.2 standard. Also, IEC and ASTM are working towards a joint standard regarding capture efficiency that is expected to be published in 2024. Since the flow rates prescribed in this proposal lack supporting data on their effectiveness, our recommendation is the council remove these changes to range hood exhaust rates until nationally recognized organizations like ASHRAE and ASTM complete their work to develop standards based on lab testing that produces an effective exhaust rate that addresses IAQ issues. One we, minute. Would support us, we would support a single ventilation rate for all range types. We ask the building council to consider these revisions before finalizing the proposed code. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I'm not seeing Anna on yet, so we'll go to the next one. Next, we have WAC 5155, which is the Wildland Urban Interface Code. And we have Andrea Smith. Andrea, your time starts now. Thank you. Good morning. Again, my name is Andrea Smith. I'm here on behalf of the Building Industry Association. We are here today in opposition of all three WUI TAG proposals that are currently up for consideration. While we appreciate the proponent including us in the development of these proposals, um, we disagree on one fundamental area. Um, which is whether the SBC has authority to adopt all sections of the 2021 version of the WUI code. 
Simply put, we do not believe that they have this authority. There's no legislative mandate for inclusion of the full body of this code. Um, the bill that was passed, um, Senate Bill 6109, only directed the SBCC to adopt specific provisions within the 2018 WUI code. Um, any code that is adopted that surpasses the 2018 version um, that covers sections um, that are not referenced directly in statute, which would be roof coverings, exterior walls, appendages and projections and driveways would be an overstep of rulemaking authority. Further, um, WUI mapping as completed by DNR is incomplete. The mapping is not helpful for local jurisdictions or builders because it does not go down to the parcel level, leaving an immense amount of discretion to the building code official for enforcement. Discretion means that there's no uniformity in enforcing this code statewide. I'd also like to state for the record that the process of adopting, adopting the proposed code amendments at the tag level was extremely rushed and lacked adequate representation from all interested stakeholders. There were only two meetings in which um, the presentation discussion and the passage of these proposals were undertaken. That is simply not enough time to make good enforceable code. Lastly, the WUI code has real impacts on constructing homes affordably. None of these proposals had any cost data provided, which alone should invalidate um, these proposals due to the incomplete nature of the code change proposal application. This is a policy as outlined in WAC 5104025 subsection two. I won't quote the entire thing, but basically it says that if a pro proponent's proposal was deemed incomplete, it shall, not, it shall not move forward. Throughout the entire process, this established procedure has been ignored um, through multiple tags. But to provide cost data for the record, the Home Innovation Lab um, study that analyzed the impacts um, of the WUI code 2021 version um, across the country for a single story home, it would add up to $31,000 to the cost, as well as um, $41,000 to the cost of a two story home. This will impact housing affordability, so much so that these proposals should not become permanent rule and it should be provided to the legislature for a potential fix this upcoming session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jeanette McKaig. Jeanette McKaig. Okay, we'll come back to that. Chris Edmark. I'm going to pass on my comments. I think Andrea said a, a lot of things. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Okay, that takes us to WAC 5156, the Uniform Plumbing Code. And we have Larry Andrews. My name's Edwin L. Andrews II. I go by Larry. Uh, president of Andrews Mechanical and my wife. Um, I'm against the uh, air admittance uh, valves. Uh, number one, it wasn't even vented through the tag process at the tag level. But the plumbing system is based on a non-mechanical device to do the work forever. And when you have an air admittance valve, you have a mechanical device that's going to fail. All mechanical items fail. The average person has no idea that these valves would be installed in their home or business. There's no reason to install an air emission valve in new construction. You can put in a passive plumbing system always in new construction. The plumbing code has a way to vent all everything in new construction. Okay, so. Um, the instructions for an air admittance valve, if it's an enlisted approved air admittance valve, comes with the air admittance valve, the manufacturer's instructions. And those are the instructions, if you were to use one, should be followed. If we are to provide a healthy place for people to live, we don't want to use these valves. We, we, we as plumbers, uh, avoid these things because we know in the future they're going to fail and cause health issues. As a plumber, you want to stay away from all these things. I was shocked when Micah talked about 
builders wanting to use these in new constructions. The only reason would be to save a little cost, but you're sacrificing the health of the community. SARS was caused by a bad vetting problem in China. Sewage gas will cause health problems up to death. One minute. And that's why plumbers protect the health of the nation. And plumbers don't want these in because of the health problems that they could cause. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, three people who had signed up uh, that were not available at the time they were called on. I'm gonna go back to them and see if they have arrived. We have Kathleen Petrie for public testimony on the International Residential Code. See her? No? Okay. We have Anna Janicek for the Mechanical Code and Fuel Gas Code. Okay, and we have Jeanette McKaig for the Wildland Urban Interface Code. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Good morning. I'm Jeanette McKaig with the Washington Realtors. Uh, I just wanna thank you for the opportunity to be here and to comment on the WUI code. Um, we uh, appreciate all the work that was done on the proposal before you, and also the proposal that was in the letter uh, dated September 28th from Micah Chappell. Um, however, we have a lot of concerns with the code proposal with respect to process um, and to some of the requirements. Uh, you know, we appreciated having a seat at, on the tag and that, uh, you know, that was a good experience to be able to get the information on the code. Trouble is, is that there wasn't sufficient time to really vet that code two days within a week and six hours. So that's enough to get to even understand what all the uh, aspects are of the code. <clears throat> so in 2018, the legislature passed uh, in gross Senate Bill 6109 um, that selected different sections of the 2018 WUI code. We think that bill, as written, did not allow the code council to go beyond the sections that were in that, that bill. Now, one of the things <clears throat> that the, uh, it allowed cities and counties to go ahead and adopt the International Urban Air Interface Code or any portion of that. So, you, you know, the cities or the counties were allowed to do that but not the international code. And there was no authority to adopt the whole code by the council. So we would say that uh, as noted in the tag meeting, they tried to go through the legislative process. There was too much legislation during a short, sh short session. One minute remaining. Okay, so um, the, so there was enough time. So I think some, folks decided that, well, let's throw it together and see what we get. Um, unfortunately, the tag was kind of an afterthought. Um, couldn't find a tag record. It was hard to find what was filed. So I think that going forward, we would ask you to consider not moving the proposal forward, going through the legislative process, allow the cities and counties to adopt whatever sections of the 2018 code that they need, and then, um, you know, just just come back and do this code maybe next year. Now, the other thing that um, that's really important, Section 302. Now, in the International Code, it allows the legislative body to do the findings of fact. And we think that's a very important thing to have happen. So we are to time. Thank you. OK. Okay, public testimony will be allowed till two o'clock today. Unless there's anyone on Zoom who has further public testimony, 
then we will pause recording and we will be available until two o'clock. Sorry, I can't. And if you have a uh, public testimony between now and two o'clock, if you raise your hand on Zoom, then we will resume recording and take your testimony at that time. We will go ahead and pause recording and be available till two o'clock. Thank you. A timer? Yeah, I'm putting you on a timer. <laughs> you already know it. Okay, we have uh, Ray Shipman who's gonna testify on the Uniform Plumbing Code. Ray, your time starts now. Thank you so much for the chance to do this. Uh, I'm here to speak in opposition of the air admittance valves in the UPC Plumbing Code. I believe it's WAC, uh, that's chapter 913. Um, I personally sat with the tag on this with the design professionals that uh, denied this to be put in the model code. Um, they sat through, and during that thing, I heard from professionals who are actually putting this in home or that are not wanting this in homes. It is a cheaper alternative to normal venting, but the only way you know that these systems fail is when you get sick. I've heard over the last two days, everybody's so concerned about the energy code and the health crisis that uh, having natural gas is, this is a bigger health crisis than having natural gas in homes. So, um, so during the process, the VFP asked to go to council. Council reviewed this. They decided that they would like to hear public testimony on it and to have it put in the appendices of the uh, plumbing code. It has actually been put in the model code. So I'm asking that it was filed um, not within the parameters that the council voted. So I'm asking it be removed from the CR 102 before filing for the CR 103. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kathleen's on? Okay. And Kathleen Petrie, you had a public testimony on the International Residential Code. Kathleen, when you begin to speak, your time will start. Uh, thank you very much. This, this is Kathleen Petrie, and I'm speaking on behalf of King County. And yes, I would like to please, uh, we request the approval of the EV charging proposal as a requirement for all new small residential construction. We support this requirement residing in either the IRC or residential portion of the energy code, whichever is most appropriate. Um, but as long as it is a base code requirement for all new construction. Under the 2020 law, Washington's required to reduce its overall greenhouse gas emissions 45% by 2030, 70% by 2040, and 95 by 2050. Almost 45% of Washington's annual greenhouse gas emissions come from transportation. Washington, along with 16 other states, have laws requiring state emissions policies to mirror those of California's Air Resources Board, requiring 100% of new passenger vehicle sales to consist of zero emission vehicles by 2035. As a part of that timeline phasing, 35% uh, of required sales are uh, EV by 2026 and 68% by 2030. Although 2035 is still the official date, the 2022 Move Ahead Washington package has a bold new policy aimed at ending sales of new internal combustion engine vehicles starting in 2030, which is just seven years away. Oakland, Culver City, and Berkeley are already targeting a 2030 deadline. Rural areas struggling with infrastructure Many locations along highways and other straight infrastructure require costly utility upgrades, um, which leave private companies wary of investing in charging sites in remote or rarely used areas. So this is a challenge. The National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program will send 71 million to Washington State over the next five years, however, and this funding in addition to other sources will provide things such as outfitting highways designated as alternative fuel corridors with chargers at least every 50 miles. 69 million will go towards grant program for the development of EV charging infrastructure in rural areas, helping to appease this range anxiety. Buildings built to this code will be occupied in 2024, 2025. Do we have enough infrastructure by 2026 to accommodate 35% of new vehicle sales? That responsibility will likely land at home more than it does today. One minute remaining. To alter a building in order to install an EV charger is much more, is much more costly and intrusive than at the time of construction. As a requirement, it will ensure all people have access to the charging system needed for new and used cars that will be purchased over the next 10 years. That a person is not uh, precluded from purchasing an electric vehicle because they are either a renter or perhaps do not have the means to buy both the vehicle and pay a contractor to make modifications to an existing home. So thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to testify and we uh, urge that you please pass this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, again, we will be available till two o'clock for public testimony. If you are on Zoom, uh, go ahead and raise your hand and we will uh, resume the recording and take your testimony at that time. Thank you. Okay, we'll continue our uh, public testimony. We have Anna Janicek, and you are doing public testimony for the International Mechanical Code and Fuel Gas Code. Let me get my uh, timer out here. Okay, Anna, when you start speaking, your three minutes will start. Thank you so much for hearing my testimony today. Uh, my name is Dr. Janicek. I'm testifying in support of updated ventilation requirements. I am a pediatric resident at Seattle Children's Hospital and a member of the Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. As a pediatrician, I see children every day whose health is affected by poor air quality. Unfortunately, none of us are strangers to the looming clouds of smoke that descend on our state caused directly by climate change, fueling wildfires every summer. Many of us close our windows and doors and are able to stay inside and escape uh, the smoke when air quality hits the orange or red zone. However, many children in this state are not able to escape smoke indoors, um, particularly children who are low income and live in small spaces without control over what fuel is used in their homes. Gas stoves emit harmful pollutants that impact the developing bodies and lungs of children, even when stoves are turned off. The amount of these indoor air pollutants reaches levels that would be deemed illegal if found outside. Because of these issues, we are seeing higher rates of diseases, including asthma, a condition that is worsened by breathing bad air. And I've seen multiple children in the ED recently with severe asthma exacerbations. Today, we've heard doubt cast on the science that clearly states that pollution indoors produced by methane gas harms our bodies. The science is still there. It doesn't matter how much those who want to recognize the science as illegitimate try to deny it. There is still science to prove these points. As a pediatrician, it's my job to follow what science tells us about how to protect the health of our children. And the science tells us that continuing to burn gas in homes and letting indoor air pollution skyrocket is making our children sick. While we cannot personally stop wildfire smoke from blowing down from Canada, and we can't prevent the next heat dome that will cause strain on our communities. One minute remaining. Today, we have the opportunity to follow science and take distinct action that will directly improve the health of families across the state. As pediatricians, I will not be quiet, and we will not be quiet about the health of our patients. I urge you to adopt the updated ventilation requirements for the health of all Washingtonians, especially our most vulnerable population, children. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you. Public testimony will continue until 2 p.m. We will stop recording. If uh, someone does have further public testimony, raise your hand in the Zoom room and uh, we will resume recording and take your testimony at that time. Thank you. Okay, this hearing is being held to consider testimony on the currently filed proposals for WAC 5150, International Building Code Structural Provisions, WAC 5150, International Existing Building Code, WAC 5151, International Residential Code, WAC 5152, International Mechanical Code, WAC 5152 International Fuel Gas Code, WAC 5155 New Washington State Wildland Urban Interface Code, and WAC 5156 Uniform Plumbing Code. All testimony presented at this hearing, along with all written comments received today, will be a part of the official hearing record for this proposal. A final adoption on adopting this rule proposal will be made on November 4th or 14th, 2022. On behalf of the State Building Code Council, thank you for participating in this hearing. This hearing stands adjourned at 2.01 p.m. Thank you.